Once upon a time, there was a Californian EV startup company called SF Motors, and they started to develop the EVs SF5 and SF7. But while developing these EVs, they came to the conclusion that, well, developing EVs costs a lot of money and a lot of resources, so they needed a partner to help them with this. So they searched around, and eventually they found the Chinese Dongfeng Motor Group. That was not too lousy to help them. So they kept on developing the EVs. In the meantime, they got a name change from SF Motors to Ceres. And after a while, Dongfeng and Ceres thought, wouldn't it be nice to already sell an EV, to already generate some money and get our name out there? But the problem is that five and seven are not done yet. So they went to the warehouses of Dongfeng, they searched around and on a shelf, they found the Dongfeng E3. So hello there, monsters and men, ladies and people. Standing over there is the Ceres E3. No, the Dongfeng 3. No, no, no. The Ceres 3, that is it is. Standing over there is the Ceres 3 and welcome to recharging. All jokes aside though, yes, this is a rebatch Dongfeng E3. But I don't care about that. I just want to know if this is a good EV or not. Just like the other Chinese EV that is available here, the MG ZS EV, this car is available in China with an internal combustion engine. So that means it is a car transformed to an EV and not designed as an EV. I think you've already seen that this is a medium-sized crossover. And size-wise, this car sits between that MG ZS EV and the other well, Chinese SUV that is available here, the iWays U5. What do I think of the looks? Well, let's just say it does not tickle me, but it does not offend me either. It is quite neutral. So logically, the size of the boot is also somewhere between that of the MG ZS EV and the iOS U5. If I open up the boot of the Ceres 3, according to Ceres, you will have a boot space of 523 liters. Well, no offense, Ceres, but I think that is a little bit too big. I mean, for example, I have seen the boot of the ID4, and Volkswagen claims that that one is 543 liters. And well, the boot of the ID4 is actually quite a bit bigger than that of the Series 3. I mean, don't get me wrong, you still have a very usable boot here, but 523 seems a little bit too much. A thing that I noticed, and well, it's really something that you miss when it is not there, is that when I opened up the boot uh, last evening to get the charge cables, it was completely dark in there because, well, the light in the boot does not switch on when you open up the boot. I mean, you're so used to that kind of things that it was completely dark in there. I mean, of course, there is a switch to turn it on manually, but for some reason it does not go on when you open up the boot. Again, it's really a feature that you miss when it is not there. If you fold down the rear seats, you will get a boot space of Unknown, <laughs> yes, unknown. I've searched the internet, EV database, even the site of Ceres do not know the amount of liters that you get when you fold down the rear seat. So have a look and determine by yourself. I cannot make an estimation. Let's have a look at the back seats of the Ceres 3. Well, there's nothing to complain back here. I mean, the scene in front of me is in my typical driving position. I am one meter and 85 centimeters and I have loads of knee room left. I can also shove my feet under the seat in front of me. The car comes fully loaded as standard, at least in the Netherlands, and there is this very nice sunroof up here. But even then, I do have this amount of headroom left. So yeah, people taller than me will also sit here just fine. Quality-wise, well, it's actually very good. There's even some soft touch material here on the door. Some nice, well, fake leather, of course, with stitching here in the door and your armrest. There is also a armrest here in the middle with two cup holders. You do have some air vents and a 12 volt socket. What I'm really surprised with though is that, well, this is a converted car. It is converted to an EV. Maybe they already kept that in mind while designing the car. I don't know. But there's basically no hump in the floor here. So <laughs> again, that's always nice. The only thing is, well, it is not the widest car. So sitting here with, with three people will probably be a little bit cramped. What still surprises me when getting into a Chinese car is the quality of the interior. I mean, it is really, really good for the price you pay. This Ceres, no exception. I mean, here on the dashboard, you do have some nice stitching with some fake leather. Soft touch is being used here on the dashboard. It all feels rock and rock solid. Soft touch and stitching in the door. Again, really impressive. And the quality is better than that of a 
Hyundai Kona or a Volkswagen ID3. It is on par with, for example, a Kia e-Niro. You also have a digital display in front of the driver and you can switch through three different layouts. Cubby space though, it is okay. You do have quite a large cubby here on the center armrest, quite a large glove box, but the door pockets are not that big and will not fit a one and a half liter bottle, I think. What I'm less impressed with though is the software of the infotainment system. It actually reminds me a lot of the infotainment system of the iWaze U5. Yes, all basic functionality is there and it works, but most car manufacturers do make nicer systems than the Chinese car manufacturers that I have tested so far. I mean, it really misses the mark on some points. Let me give you a few examples. Uh, first, the translation. Yes, you know what is being meant most of the times, but in many places it is not proper English or proper Dutch. Yes, the instrument cluster in front of the driver is in English, while the infotainment system itself is in Dutch, which is also slightly odd. Second, second example, uh, I want to list all the radio stations that I can receive. I get a list of frequencies and I do not get the name behind those frequencies. I do not know from the top of my head <laughs> at what frequency my favorite radio station is. So I have to look it up on my phone. Oh, it's on 95.2. Okay, I select 95.2. I mean, I think it is basic functionality in infotainment systems to, for example, put your, uh, to put the radio station's name behind the frequency. And for it, I mean, there is some third party navigation software in here. It's called TurboDoc. I mean, I, lo I love that name, but I do not love the software. It is just not working well enough. So yeah, um, again, the basic functionality is there. It works, but you can clearly see that the Chinese car manufacturers do still have a way to go with their infotainment systems. I mean, some things can be fixed with a software update and Sierra has already announced a software update for the infotainment system, but right now, yeah, it is just, it's working, but it is not great. And the last thing is this car does not have support for Android Auto or Apple CarPlay, and it will not get support for those things either. But what it does have, and I found this quite funny to see, is that it uses the same system as the iWaze uses. It's called Easy Connect, and what it does, it mirrors your phone. From experience, it works well enough, but I still prefer Android Auto or Apple CarPlay. Before I start driving, first a few things that I noticed with this car. The first thing is, when you start the car, a lot of times you hear water starting to flow. And it makes me curious, what is that sound? Because, well, I've never heard that before in any car. But I think it is the air conditioning kicking in for the first time. The second thing is the adjustability of the steering wheel. I mean, it is not good. You can move the steering wheel up and down, but not even that much. And you cannot pull it towards you. And because of that, well, you may have trouble finding a good driving position in this car. The third thing is the fan of the climate control. I mean, it is the loudest fan that I have ever heard in any car. The fourth thing is in the instrument cluster in front of the driver, you can actually see the battery temperature. I mean, for a lot of people, this is useless information, but I really, really like that. <laughs> and the fifth thing is, this car has a dash cam as standard. I mean, really nice, I like that. So that, those are a few things that I noticed. Let's start driving. Let's talk specifications, because the Series 3 has 163 horsepower with 300 newton meters of torque. With that, it can do zero to 100 in about 8.9 seconds, and the car is limited to 155 kilometers an hour. But there is something going on with the amount of power that this car is outputting. Because this car can output a maximum of 120 kilowatts. But in a lot of reviews you hear that the car feels a lot slower. And there's also a power meter in front of the driver. And also those reviews are saying that, well, they cannot get that power meter to go beyond 85 kilowatts. When I first picked up the car, I floored it and well the car was not outputting more than 85 kilowatts which is kind of strange because well you can never make that 8.9 seconds with 85 kilowatts and while driving around with this car i noticed that the that the amount of power that this car delivers really depends on one the temperature of your battery and two your state of charge let me give you an example i was driving around with this car to test it to feel it and well, the car could not output more than, again, 85 kilowatts. The state of charge was about 55%. Uh, 
I, uh, the battery was at around 12 to 13 degrees and I did go to a fast charger and I fast charged the car to about 70%. This car does have a liquid cooled battery so it heated up the battery and when I finished fast charging the state of charge of this car was about 70% and the battery temperature was about 20 degrees. And suddenly when I floored, uh, when I floored the pedal to the ground the car could output 105 kilowatts. And then yesterday, another day, um, I wanted to, to test the fast charging again. The battery temperature was about 15 degrees. My state of charge was only 20%. I fast charged the car to about 35% and the battery was 20 degrees again. But I couldn't output 105 kilowatts. I could only output 75 kilowatts, about 75 kilowatts. So that got me thinking and I'm pretty sure that the power limit of this car is really determined by, well, your, well, again, your battery temperature and your state of charge. But the problem is the car doesn't tell you that you have a power limit. I mean, for example, in a Tesla, you can see that you have a power limit. In this car, it doesn't tell you at all, which is, well, I think not good or serious because, well, a lot of people don't know this and they never notice it. They buy the car or they test drive the car. They think, I drive a car with 120 kilowatts, but the car is only outputting 85 kilowatts. And with normal driving, you don't heat up the battery that much that it will be that 25 degrees, I think, to reach that maximum of 120 kilowatts. So people think, well, this car doesn't deliver what it promised that it can deliver. So what I would <laughs> advise Sirius to do is somehow uh, show people that you have a power limit because you, you have too low state of charge or because the battery temperature is too low. Because right now you don't know, you can only find out by figuring it out like me. And well, a lot of people don't do that or they don't know that. And well, they think the car is not outputting what it's supposed to do. I will not buy it or it is a crappy car. So please Ceres, work on your software with that. This car has a 53.6 kilowatt hour battery and 52 kilowatt hours of that is usable energy. So that means this car barely has a top buffer. And you can also notice that because when the car is charged to 100%, there's almost no regenerative braking. Of course, as soon as the state of charge gets lower, your regenerative braking will increase up to a certain limit. And you can also set in the infotainment system the amount of regenerative braking this this car should do when you lift your foot off the accelerator. You actually have three settings for that. The, the claimed WLTP range for this car is 329 kilometers. Well, it is about 10 degrees outside right now. Uh, keep in mind, I am testing this car. So on the highway, I'm doing somewhere between 100 and 130 kilometers an hour. I'm doing some faster acceleration to test the car and I managed to get a range of about 220 to 225 kilometers so in winter i do expect you can get that 225 kilometers in summer i do expect that you can get a range of around 270 kilometers i mean those are about the same numbers that for example a ds3 crossback or peugeot 2008 can do i mean it's not terrible it's not great the CRS only has a single phase onboard charger, so that means it can take up a maximum of 6.6 .6 kilowatts and then charging it from 0 to 100% will take you about 9 hours. But on a 16 amp 3 phase charger, which can deliver 11 kilowatts like this one, it will only take 3.6 and then filling it up will take you about 16 hours, so a really long night. Fast charging capabilities then, well, according to Ceres, it can take 100 kilowatts and according to other reviews, it can take 60 kilowatts. So the truth is probably somewhere in between, but charging it from 10 to 80% will take you about the usual 40 minutes. So how does this car drive? Well, don't expect anything sporty. I mean, the way this car drives actually reminds me of the MG ZS EV. And that is because, well, just like the MG ZS EV, this car has a very comfortable suspension. A downside though about that comfortable suspension is that when you take a corner with a higher speed, the car tends to lean a little bit. And also when you take a speed bump with a higher speed, you can reach the maximum travel distance of the suspension. Also the steering is light without any feeling. I mean, I have no idea what is going on down there, but if you just take it easy, this car will get you from A to B in all comfort without any excitement. 
Even though this is the fully loaded version, this car does not have any active driving or safety features. So that means, yes, this car has lane departure warning, but it does not actively keep you in lane. Yes, this car does have cruise control, but it does not have adaptive cruise control. Yes, this car warns you when you're about to hit something, but it does not actively brake when it detects that you're going to hit something. And this car does not have blind spot monitoring. So in this regard, this car lacks a little. So what do I think of the Ceres 3? Well, I don't think it is a bad car, but it does not excel in anything either. And that doesn't matter if the price is right. But the version that is standing here, yes, it comes fully loaded, but in the Netherlands it costs you almost 38,000 euros. And for that 38,000 euros, you can also get a base model Volkswagen ID3, a base model Peugeot 2008, a Hyundai Kona, a Kia e-Niro. And then the question is, is that rich equipment enough to lure people away from the known brands to a yet unknown Ceres 3? That was the review of the Ceres 3. I hope you liked it and if you did, well, please give a like and do subscribe. If you did not, well, please leave a comment below to see what I can improve. And then I would like to say now, thank you a lot for watching and as always, to be continued.